Happy 20th anniversary Artix Entertainment. How many game companies even last that long nowadays? How's it going guys? I'm your host Corban Gaming and welcome back to another very special video. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the two words Artix Entertainment? Adventure Quest? Dragon Fable? Mech Quest? AQ Wolves? Whichever it may be, it is undeniable that this game company holds a special place in our hearts, especially for a lot of kids born in the 90s and early 2000s. Today, let me take you on a nostalgic trip down memory lane as I go through the top 20 most iconic things in the AE multiverse, be it NPCs, places, or even items. Number 20. To kickstart the list, we have Carnex, destroyer of the Talados civilization and more widely known as the Big Green, supposedly unbeatable alien boss by many Adventure Quest players. Carnex is one of the original antagonists of AQ Classic and was created by Makisa and a group of corrupt wizards. While his story in AQ has long ended, he has been brought up multiple times in the AE multiverse for some of their more iconic events like AQ's 10th anniversary or more recently in AQ Wars as the second world boss ever for the company's 20th anniversary event. How is Karnak so iconic? I might even argue that this design of Vilgax from Ben 10 Alien Force was heavily inspired by Karnak's. Just take a look at the similarities. Number 19. Valencia, the daughter of world-renowned treasure hunter Treasure Hunter. She is known for her purple hair and her love for all things rare and shiny. Not many NPCs in the AE multiverse gets a cameo in almost every game, but Valencia is one of them. What's even more impressive is that she's so iconic even though she's not based off any real staff member. Well, at least not to my knowledge. Number 18. Robina. Steal from the rich and give to the poor. Essentially AE's version of Robin Hood in female form. Interestingly enough, she is also the daughter of King Eltion, which makes her a princess. But more people know her as a master archer and a master thief as opposed to a royal bloodline. She also gives the gold she steals to... Monsters? What monsters want to go for, I have no idea. Do they actually buy stuff with the gold? Is gold one of their primary food sources? That's gonna be a question for another day. Number 17. Sneevos. The box-loving green goblins made their first appearance in Dragon Fable and is also one of the first few monsters you encounter in that game. Anyone who has played Dragon Fable before probably knows what a Sneevo is. I mean, who can forget smashing into those little guys into their box forts with their level 2 character, right? Number 16. Chicken Cow. It is, as its name suggests, a hybrid between a chicken and a cow. There isn't any other game out there that has made a hybrid like this, so I gotta give AE props for the idea. Why chicken and cow? I don't know. Could be because they're two of the most widely consumed meats on the planet and Artix was thinking of his dinner as he was thinking up the abomination. This peculiar species also has a god by the name of Zeuster. A god? They also based this year's April Fool's cross game event on this animal and it was also AQ World's first world boss. Number 15. Dragon Blade. The sword held by the mighty dragon slayer Galanoff. Made of Dragon's Bane, this was one of the two more iconic no-drop weapons in AQ Classic back in the day. Back when Essence Dragon's farming was a thing, this weapon just cuts through them like a hot knife through butter. While it has lost most of its glory today, it still remains as a top option for dragon slaying in the AE multiverse. Number 14. Zarts. If Sneevers were the iconic starter monsters for Dragon Fable, then Zarts were the iconic starter monsters for AQ Classic. These little green frogs served as your punching bag every time you encounter them and while they have no particular strengths, they don't really have any particular weaknesses either. That is until the good old Zart Master came along with his 101 variations of these guys. The Zart's popularity also spread to the rest of AE's games and we have also seen different versions of them in AQ Worlds and AQ 3D. Number 13. Dracaf. The original heir to the throne before the big bad Eltion came along. I will say that the most iconic version of Dracaf had to be his AQ Worlds version as he served as the game's primary antagonist for well over a decade. While I was a little disappointed that the Queen of Monsters power completely overshadowed this epically powerful villain that had been built up over many years, I'm glad that Dracaf still has an important role to play in today's story even if he is more of a side character anti-hero more than anything else. His purple chaos powers will be something that is well remembered for years to come. Number 12. Cicero The hammer-wielding mad weapon smith easily identifiable by his green tunic. While he has always been more of a goofy comic relief character, he wields some pretty considerable power, almost to the extent of being on par with Wallach. It is a little sad that the staff this NPC was based off on has moved on to better prospects and wasn't here to celebrate AE's 20th anniversary, but his messy hair and eccentric character will continue to live on in the hearts of many players. 
Number 11, Galanov. Wielder of the Dragon Blade and every dragon's worst nightmare, he is also one of the few characters in AE that has made it in most of their games. The reason why his face is always hidden underneath his mask is because of some nasty burn marks he suffered from dragons since young. I mean, if someone burnt my face to that extent and killed my entire family, I would probably go after the entire race too. If there was a what if universe, what do you guys think Galanov might be today if someone had saved him and his family from that tragedy years ago? Number 10 And sitting on the top 10 spot, we have the blinding light of destiny. Wielded by the most popular paladin in all of AE, this axe was first popularized in Dragon Faber for its insane goal requirements during the time of its release. Its hardcore farming popularity also found its way into AQ Worlds, being one of the two most hardcore OG farms back in the day. Number 9, Guardian Blade. The standard issue weapon for Guardians. Personally, I'm a huge fan of its design and it is probably one of the most unique weapon designs I've seen in all of gaming. Also well recognized as the precursor before you get your Blade of Awe, this weapon doesn't have much going for it in terms of practicality, but the art to me is just chef's kiss. Number 8, Guardian Dragon. Who can forget that big green lizard that always greeted you on the old homepage of Battle On? It never really became a full-fledged character, but it's still very iconic nonetheless, having found its home in your Blade of Awe and appearing when you least need him to. Well, I guess that's also one way of making your players remember you, right? Number 7, Warlick. The blue mage whose power knows no bounds. But of course, with great power comes great responsibility, and it also means that he usually can't use his powers to solve simple problems because plot, right? His character was based off of one of AE's original staff who still happens to be around today. He has not only made appearances in most of AE's games, but usually also have a pivotal role in the main story as well. Number 6, Doom Blade. This has to be quite possibly the most iconic weapon in all of Dragon Fable. A simple design, but has left such a deep impression in the minds of many DF players. It's also worth noting that the blade is sentient and is also the one controlling Sepulcher, not the other way around for those who may be unaware. An equally iconic version of the weapon is the necrotic sword of doom that can be used by players. Number 5, Guardian Tower. The Big Stone Tower, home of Law's elite protector force, the Guardians, serves as the centerpiece of Falcon Reach in Dragon Fable and Battle On in AQ Classic and AQ Worlds. Easily one of the most recognizable buildings in the AE multiverse, it will not be wrong to assume that players see this building more than any other in the aforementioned three games. It is also distinguishable by its grey stone bricks as well as falcon perched on top of it for Dragon Fable and Dragon for Adventure Quest. Number 4, The Blade of Awe. The most iconic weapon in Adventure Quest and quite possibly the entirety of the AE multiverse. It's so powerful that it was split up into 5 fragments that you have to painstakingly find before you can assemble it in AQ Classic. Only to have it snapped in half like some twig by a random nobody in one of the game's side quests. It also retained its farming difficulty in AQ Wars, but at least in exchange you not only unlock the blade but also some very powerful enhancements for your other weapons. And now, moving on to our top 3. At number 3, we have Sepulcher, the badass that served as the antagonist of Book 1 in Dragon Fable. As a kid, I was only focused on how badass he was, but it was only later on that I realized that he had such a sad story. Not only did he lose his wife, was made use of by his weapon, but he was also betrayed by his servant at a critical moment. Unfortunately, Aquus did him dirty and he was essentially nothing but a shell of his original self in that game. Was that absolutely necessary to make his daughter shine? Coming in at the second spot, we have Twilly. The adorable Red Moglin serves as the game's cute animal mascot. Twilly in AE is basically equivalent to Pikachu in Pokemon. Do you know that Twilly was originally supposed to look like this? Boy, am I glad they changed it. I mean, what successful franchise doesn't have a cute animal mascot? A Moglin that specializes in healing magic, Twilly was never really part of anything important but is somehow always around. And at the number 1 spot, we have the man himself, Artix Krieger. I mean, it's literally the name of the game company. If you play any of their games, you have to know the overly obsessed Undead Slaying Paladin. Despite being the creator of all the games, he was never really more than a sidekick in any of the games if I'm being honest. His signature shiny armor, red cape, and blinding light of Destiny X was almost as much of a superhero image in the minds of many kids growing up in the early 2000s as other more famous superheroes like Batman and Superman. Say what you want about the guy, but it is undeniable that he had a large part to play in our childhood and for that he absolutely deserves the number one spot on this list. And there you have it guys, what do you think of the list? 
What else do you guys think should have been on the list or what do you think shouldn't have been on the list? Let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Also, huge shout out to this subscriber for giving me the idea to make this video. If you guys like the video, then be sure to give it a thumbs up. And of course, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you guys like to see more Artix Entertainment related content. I have some very exciting ideas coming up and I'd love for all of you AE players to come along for the ride. Till the next time, I'm your host Korriban Gaming. Peace out.